<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Let me just close these doors. Hold on a second. Good evening. Um, my name's Uva Brandis. Welcome to Georgetown. Um, a lot of you have already heard me tell this very corny joke at this point, but um, uh, I know the room is very uh, sensitive to Metro. Uh, Metro is obviously not in Georgetown. Uh, we are Georgetown. We are near Metro. So if you can't get Metro to Georgetown, you get Georgetown to Metro. So welcome. And, and I always, um, <laughs> thanks, Rick. Thanks. Thanks for the clap, Rick. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I always tell people, you know, kind of like squint your eyes. That's, uh, I'm not going to go there. Um, I always encourage people to kind of squint your eyes, imagine brick buildings, a little bit of ivy growing around. Um, we are at Georgetown. So welcome to Georgetown. Um, over the years now, Stuart, um, not just one or, once or twice, but over the years, um, we've uh, organically uh, developed this amazing relationship with the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, I've known uh, Stuart and Cheryl for many, many years, but it is really exciting. Uh, it remains exciting, uh, and I hope it will continue to be exciting um, to really think about how to partner, how to harness this amazing space and convene people, uh, and to start conversations and dialogues that hopefully um, are not just interesting, um, but impactful. And uh, so it's in that spirit. I welcome everyone here tonight. Um, and quick note on logistics. Um, if you go out the door and take a left, you'll find the restrooms and there's open Wi-Fi if you choose to join it. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Uva and Georgetown for, for hosting us, the Georgetown with the Metro. Um, they have been wonderful hosts to us to have this room, have a great technical team, sound team uh, that has taken good care of us with this event. Many of you may have participated in our previous bus events. Uh, have a, can I have a show of hands who else has been to a forum with CSG here? Hey, pretty good number, and maybe about 30, uh, one third that have not. Um, so the, the Coalition for Smarter Growth, uh, those who don't know, we've been around now for 22 years. We work throughout the DC, Maryland, Virginia metro region here around Washington. Uh, we are probably the leading nonprofit that has tried to shape where and how this region will grow, uh, connecting land use, transportation, housing, and the, and the environment. And we have, you know, we've been really pleased by the success we've had. We've done it in coalition and partnerships with uh, all sorts of conservation groups, transit advocacy groups, and now business groups. And on Monday, we launched with Metro Now, our business partnerships that included Greater Washington Partnership, who's here. Joe and Maggie are here from, from uh, Greater Washington Partnership. Uh, Board of Trade, 2030 Group, Northern Virginia Chamber. Uh, uh, who am I missing? Federal City Council. Uh, they were the ones who worked with us on the Metro funding campaign to win the first ever dedicated funding from three jurisdictions in one three month period. Um, and what I'm really impressed by is our region's business community's commitment to better buses. And we need them, uh, we need their clout, we need our own clout, we need all of you if we're gonna have better buses. And part of our Better Buses campaign now is to bring in great experts and wise advisors like Stephen, who we're gonna hear from in just a minute. Um, I also want to thank Smart Growth America, our other co-sponsor. Uh, Erica Young is here. She'll be on the panel. I'll introduce her a bit in, in a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, Calvin Gladney, their CEO, was not able to attend tonight. Uh, I actually serve on their board. And uh, Cheryl and I have known Calvin from his pre-SGA days when he was a local developer and sustainable and equitable developer here in Washington, D.C., uh, and he has taken over from longtime CEO Jeff Anderson, who many of you know. And he has really extended the programs of SGA to ensure that uh, social equity is a core part of what they do. As he and others have said, your zip code should not be your life determinant. And we are looking for sustainable, healthy communities and opportunities for everyone collectively. Uh, one other thing I will wrap up with in terms of our conversation, uh, we're all in our end of year nonprofit fundraising, right, Erica? <laughs> um, so your support, we much appreciate what we feel it's at CSG, uh, Jane and Jillian from the team and Cheryl are all here from the team, is the urgency of the moment. If there are just 10 years to address climate change, what can we do? Can we do it faster? And I absolutely think we can. What's in our wheelhouse at, S at CSG and 
also at SGA, but what's in our wheelhouse is land use, transit-oriented development, affordable housing, near transit, more transit, safe, walkable communities. And there's no reason this region should be taking as long to continue to implement these things. So we are going to push them hard in the coming year. We're still going to stay positive about all the wonderful positive things about it, but, but, you know, but pointing fingers and being slow about it, we, we're not going to be happy with. So you guys have all been part of helping this push, and a lot of times government staff want to have that push so that they can do more, and many of you are doing that stuff within the government. Um, let me introduce Stephen now. Uh, we have his wonderful book. I first met Stephen when I went to the Virginia Transit Association, relatively small conference in Williamsburg, and somehow he found his way out of New York City. He's a double NYU grad, and he found himself to Williamsburg, the, that old sleepy little ca former capital of, of Virginia. And it was a revelation, what he told uh, the you know, VTA then and my uh, you know, sort of casual meeting with Stephen at the time. And that developed a great relationship between CSG and Transit Center. And, um, but we're just one of the groups that Transit Center has been really helpful to. Uh, there are groups across the country organized as a transit advocacy coalition by Transit Center, an organization that combines think tank, foundation, and grassroots campaigners. So, and, you know, and, and it's, these features are even combined in individuals like Steven, because he's not only a policy guy, I love the fact that there are pictures of him that you can find on Twitter and other places of him holding up a cutout of Governor Cuomo on the metro, on the subway system in New York, uh, sort of asking, where's Waldo? Where's the, where was the governor on the, met on the subway system in New York? A very effective grassroots campaign. So we'll hear a lot from Steven tonight about this combination of policy advocacy and grassroots to bring change and better buses. So please welcome Stephen. All right, thank you so much for that introduction, Stuart. Thank you to the coalition for Smart Growth America, for Georgetown uh, for having me, and, and thanks all of you for coming. It is such an exciting and important moment right now to set the future of transit in DC. And uh, I'm really excited to, to be here and to talk a little bit about um, what I've learned about, or what are the, some of the lessons that I can bring from the uh, dozens of people who I interviewed in the course of researching uh, this book, and also the transit advocates and the transit leaders throughout the country that we work with at Transit Center. If you're not familiar with Transit Center, as Stuart mentioned, we are a foundation. We're based in New York, but we also research what makes people choose transit, what effective transit is, and we support independent civic organizations in cities coast to coast who are working for better service, more equitable fares, and transit system that allows everyone to live their lives. Um, and so, um, let's see, when, when I started researching this book, I have to admit, I was a little pessimistic. We in this country take 4.7 billion trips a year on the bus. And yet, so many of those trips are miserable. They're crowded, they're unreliable. Um, there are many stops that are worse than this one where you're just sitting there or standing there on the side of the road without even a sidewalk or a shelter or a bench while you know, other folks are sort of passing you by. And I began to ask myself, why is this? And it's also, I think, a real shame because there's so much at stake when we talk about buses and transit. We really have to reckon with the fact that A, Transportation is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the country. And when we talk about transportation, we're not talking about the need for high-speed rail or the need for people to fly less. We are talking about the daily trips that we make, the trips in our everyday economy, our everyday transportation system to get to work, to get to school, to go to the grocery store, to go to church. This is what we have to confront. And we also know, and I write about this quite a bit in the book, that it's not enough to electrify personal vehicles. It's not enough to electrify the status quo. That if you look at local, state, national, and international climate modeling, not only do we have to electrify vehicles, we also have to build the places and the communities 
that allow us to drive less. This is just one example. It's from the California Air Resources Board showing that for California to meet its climate change goals, not only will every car have to be electric by 2050, but Californians will have to drive about 15% less. We have to reckon with the fact that we have a status quo in so many US cities where if you have a car, this is New Orleans, you know, you can pretty much get to where you need to go. There's, you have the freedom to explore the whole city. And if you aren't rely on transit, that is how much smaller your life is. And it's the case in so many of our places. And what this means is that even low-income people, low-income households are inevitably, be, inevitably going to turn to car ownership because that's what you have to do to thrive. And yet this ends up being a financial trap of its own. We have record levels of automobile debt in this country. There's great research following what happens to low-income families. They often go in and out of car ownership. They get a car because they need to get a job, and then you know, the transmission goes, or there's a parking ticket, and it's back to square one, and it's just financially ruinous. And finally, what's at stake? We also know that the simple geometry of our cities means that we cannot grow, we cannot remain prosperous, we can't grow in a sustainable way unless we have high quality, high capacity transit. We are always going to need that. And so the stakes are quite high. The good news is that when you actually look at what it takes to create transit, to create bus systems that people choose to ride, it's really straightforward. I go into the research into quite a bit in the book. I'm going to, you know, skip over that a little bit because I think people are sort of on board with this agenda here. But it's really simple, fundamental things. If you make the bus frequent, you make it fast, you make it dependable, you make it a dignified experience so that people feel respected when they use it. And that means, you know, having a safe environment. It means being protected from the sun and the rain and the elements. People choose it. And in the many places that have improved bus service, you see ridership rebound quite quickly. So, and I wanna note, we knew how to do this right here in DC 40 years ago. And so in a lot of ways, you know, this is just about going back to the future, right? So when I was researching the book, I sort of came to this, this question, okay, it's pretty obvious. We know what it takes to make buses work. Why is the experience of the bus still so miserable in so many places? And you, know, you see it all over the place. The truth is, it's about politics, and it's about the fact that bus riders and transit is often so low on the political agenda. You see this play out at the neighborhood level, where privileged stakeholders often block transit projects because they're concerned about parking, or because they have prejudiced notions about who rides transit. And you see this all the way up to the federal level. When you look at the structures of our federal funding programs, where you sort of see that when states want to build highways, they essentially get blank check, no strings attached funding from the government. And when we want to pay for transit in so many places, uh, the available funding is so small that localities end up going to the voters. That's a huge structural difference. You know, you have to run a huge campaign in places like Nashville and Los Angeles and Seattle to get funding for transit. If you want to build or widen a highway in those places, it's just free money from the government, from the federal government, essentially. And so to get around this, when you look at the many, at the places, and there are many places from Indianapolis to Miami to Seattle to Houston that have overcome this, that have turned bus service around, it starts with building power. And in all those places, it often happens through an alliance of the kinds of people that Stuart mentioned. Outside, people outside government, civic advocates, social movements, leaders within public agencies who understand that planning transportation is a political endeavor, that planning is not this um, sort of valueless or completely technocratic exercise, that the politics really matter, and of course, the actual bold politicians and elected leaders themselves. So I just wanna talk a little bit about those political lessons and some lessons they might have for DC that are particularly important. Um, 
One of the things that I think is so exciting about the moment in DC is that you have this coalition, the Metro Now Coalition that Stuart mentioned, a coalition that was able to go and get hundreds of millions of dollars of dedicated funding for transit. The questions I would have for the folks in this room and beyond, based on what you see in other places, is I think we have to recognize that, and it may seem a little paradoxical, the same groups that can win hundreds of millions of dollars in funding for transit often cannot win a bus lane in a neighborhood. And that's because you have to ask who from the neighborhood is being represented, who is organizing transit riders, who is showing up there with the stature, with that sort of moral stature and that ability to organize the actual people who are benefiting from transit. And that's also a resource question too, you know, for uh, Transit Center is a foundation. We work with many local foundations as well. I think the fastest way to grow power in many places the local philanthropic community has to really has to be involved. So those are questions. There's incredible stuff to build on here. And I think answering these questions will provide some direction as to how to build on it. Um, and I want to sort of do a little bit of a close read of the bus transformation project. I think it's really exciting that these are some of the recommendations that this group came up with. So much of this is exactly what we need to make the bus great in DC. Frequent service, fast service. They talk about shelters, equitable fares. But the question is, you go a little bit deeper into the uh, action plan, which they were presenting to the WMATA board this morning, and you see that there is, um, you see that there is a sort of a gap in the timeline. And that is not the fault of the bus transformation project. It's just about where does this go next? You know, what sort of happens between 2020, 2021, 2025? Here's what it might look like. This is Portland, 20 bus priority projects that they are bringing to the city council in early next year. New York City, 24 bus priority projects that we have a commitment. Uh, some of, many of these are underway. Uh, some of these are committed to start this year. Some of these will probably slip a little bit off the schedule and actually start next year. But the point is we have a mayoral commitment and it, and it happened because a lot of advocacy. So I think the question for both DC and the other jurisdictions for this whole region is, where are your first 20 bus priority projects? And how do you create the transportation agencies that have the capacity to deliver those projects in one or two years. That's a huge challenge. Um, I don't have the complete answer to it, but I have some notions. I think that it is probably not going to look like this. You know, we, so many of the bus corridor projects um, that I've seen, that I've worked on, go through this process where they're essentially something like a slim down uh, highway interchange project or a rail project where we ask our riders, we ask folks in the community to show up for a set of public meetings around you know, existing conditions, 30% design, full design. And we tell them that the project is going to be done in five years. Sometimes it takes even longer than that. That is a really hard sell for people, many of whom honestly don't even see themselves as living in the same neighborhood five years from now. And we really have to rethink how we do projects. The good news is that you have an amazing example right here, the H and I street lanes. It is, I think, remarkable to me to see what happened in DC over the summer where you put bus priority in a place that is crying out for it. You iterate a little bit, you survey, you see how people are responding. And then within a few months, it's permanent. Scale that up and you'll have immense benefits. And that is exactly what is happening in many of the places that have worked, that have tried out this tactical transit model. A few years ago, um, Boston was a pioneer of this tactical transit notion. That was a place that hadn't had a bus lane in 10 years. They put one of these tactical projects in and it, they were so excited about the reception that they've now put in four or five lanes in a very short amount of time. It's a cycle of enthusiasm that feeds on itself. Um, I think another thing that we can learn here from successful transit organizations, transit agencies around the country is there is a way to do community engagement that supports and grows community organizing. Um, this is the Better Bus Stops program in Metro Transit, uh, the Twin Cities. 
they paid neighborhood groups, those groups surveyed riders, and they were able to get uh, survey feedback on like where and how to site bus shelters that was representative of the public in terms of their racial demographics, income, disability status. These are things that are really, really hard challenges in community engagement. They were able to do it. And those are the same groups that are turning around and supporting and fighting for transit. So I think we have to think about the ways in which public agencies and civic organizations are really natural allies and design our public processes in ways that help make that happen. And then of course it comes down to thinking about the skills and capacities within our agencies. Seattle is one of America's uh, amaz most amazing new transit success stories. And when you look behind the curtain and, and look at what's happening, part of it is the fact that, for example, King County Metro, the bus agency, has a team of traffic engineers, which is very odd for a transit agency. But the, that team goes around to all the small jurisdictions in the counties. It sells those municipal leaders on uh, the need to prior on the need to speed up bus service. Perhaps it's you know changing signal timing here or putting in a queue jump there, and then it provides technical assistance. It's almost like uh, a group of doctors doing house calls in these places. These often very small jurisdictions that don't have large transportation staff. King County Metro is sort of the center of excellence doing that. And conversely, the Seattle Department of Transportation has a 28-person transit division creating a pipeline of transit projects and measuring success, you know, taking on transit access as a goal and saying that, yes, in Seattle, we do not run bus service, but it is our goal to improve access to transit. So, oh, and yes, this all does require hiring people. This was a, a, a recent announcement from the city of Boston. Like many other places, the city of Boston was one of those cities that didn't have a single person in city government whose job it was to improve bus service. It was all the transit agency's job, but that has to change. I was really excited to see that uh, there is a job posting right now at the District Department of Transportation hiring two people to uh, work on transit projects. That application is open until the 19th, I believe, if anyone's looking for a change of scenery. Uh, that's a really great start. I, I suspect it is probably just a start in terms of what is needed. So I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, we often think about transit planning as a technical exercise. And of course it is. But if we want to transform bus networks, we also have to understand networks of power. And when you look at the places that have succeeded in transforming their transit systems, it's because leaders across sectors recognized that, worked with each other, achieved small wins that built up to large transformative ones. I mentioned at the start of this presentation that I, I, I came into researching this book in sort of a pessimistic mood, but I, but I exited so excited and so optimistic about what we can achieve when we work together. And I firmly believe that you all can achieve it here in this region as well. Thank you. Now that's the positive attitude I love to hear. That's great. Um, let's uh, do about two questions for Stephen before we start the panel here. Do we have any questions? If not, we'll start the panel and you, you'll build your question. All right, Andrew. Hey. Hi, Stephen. Uh, we spoke earlier. I'm Andrew yeah. Keurig, WMATA Writers Advisory Council. Um, one complication for us is that we are technically the um, wards, I guess you could say, of the WMATA board. And so we have to exercise, especially on Twitter, good judgment about what we tweet and how much we criticize and what we can say. Do you have, what's, what in that position, taking into account the fact that they really obviously listen to us and read our reports and things, obviously. Um, what would you suggest would be a good strategy for us moving forward on something like buses? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I think it's a question that in a lot of ways is relevant to government staff as well, because of course, for folks who are working inside uh, public agencies, you know, you may have very strong feelings about what needs to change, but you have to be careful about how you say it. And that's a very real thing. I think that um, one of the most important things you can do inside government or on our writers council like this is to um, collect 
data, do research in ways that you know that transit allies can pick up and use in a really helpful way. So for example, the New York City Department of Transportation sort of recognizing that existing metrics weren't, um, weren't quite, they weren't super strategic. One of the things that they did that I think is really exciting is they track uh, sales tax revenue uh, bef at businesses before and after a new bus corridor opens. And so then they have these great numbers like, you know, we put this bus lane in the Bronx and sales increased by 20% at businesses along the corridor. And that's much more than they did borough wide. And that is not an advocacy statement in and of itself, but it's something that is so easy for stakeholders to pick up and use. So thinking about what you can do in these, um, in these sort of more formal settings that, other, that others can pick up and use. And often, you know, you may have access to um, inside information. You may have access to people inside the agency. That's access that not everyone has. So your, your ability to share that can be really powerful. So that's one thing I'd say. Oh, great. <laughs> I gotta be careful with budding politicians. <laughs> Never give up the mic to a politician. <laughs> Hi, uh, Stephen. Thanks for being here, and thanks for uh, sh showing this the, the the plan on 16th Street uh, that took that clearly was uh, taking way too long. It's been very frustrating. Uh, we uh, as bus advocates here in DC. My name is Kishin Puto, by the way. Uh, I was uh, on 16th Street, living at 16th and R as an ANC commissioner, watching all the action below with uh, the buses being way out of whack for so long. We put up signs. We did everything we were supposed to do. We put up signs from downtown DC to Silver Spring, Maryland, and got people out and got the commitment to do this. But it, I mean, like there's kids who are like in kindergarten when this started and like they needed the bus to get to school. And now <laughs> they're in junior high at a whole new school, just like you were saying. Um, what is it uh, that you think can uh, add the pressure to actually get it done once a commitment is made, uh, have you, in your experience, have you seen there's a fight to get them to agree to do it, and then there's a fight to get them to actually get it done? Uh, what, uh, what have you seen, and uh, can you give us any <laughs> advice? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think there's a magic bullet. I think a lot of it comes down to continuing to organize in those places. I mean, one of the reasons that I brought, that I sort of compared the traditional bus corridor process and the tactical process is that the tactical process does make the politics easier. It does change the power dynamic where when you have a pilot project, not only is it shorter overall, so you're not, you're not asking sort of community organizers and, and residents to step into this year's long process, but also the moment the pilot is activated, it's this wow moment where all of a sudden thousands or tens of thousands of people are benefiting and it becomes easier to mobilize those people because now it's not about building this coalition that's going to go through this years-long siege to win something where which you know some people are not going to be around for it's you know potentially thousands of people who are defending this gain that they've made so it really does change the politics and you know i'm not suggesting that i have a special insight into 16th Street. I'm not making recommendations on what they should do. Instead, I did talk to folks at DDOT and within the advocacy community, and I think they, there are some sort of unique circumstances around 16th Street having to do with you know, historic preservation and the fact that they hadn't done a project like this in several years. So it's not about that individual project. It's about thinking about what do we do going forward, knowing that if we want to improve transit at scale, we need you know, sort of faster democracy. Tell you what, let's bring the panel up here. Uh, Jordan, Cheryl, Erica, and Stephen, grab your seats. Jordan, you might grab the end one there. Uh, let me introduce him real quick. Uh, many of you probably know, maybe you've not seen his face, but you've heard him on the radio, Jordan Pascal from our own WAMU. I first met him, I think, wandering the General Assembly in Richmond uh, when he was reporting for the Virginian pilot. And uh, I think you were in culture shock when you first got up here. Yes, very It was much. a little bigger than your uh, home state of Nebraska and uh, yeah, what much. was going on down there. And today we were talking at the WMATA board. You mentioned that you, you could go to three different transportation meetings a night in the D.C. region. You, you really could if you wanted to. Yeah. Yes, I think so. So, they, you know, it's not the nationals. Our sport is transportation. Um, 
So he's great, great to have him here, and he's following in the footsteps of uh, Martin DeCaro in terms of moderating a panel shoes, for us here. Big shoes. <laughs> big shoes. Um, Erica Young, one of our allies with Smart Growth America. Uh, a lot of legislative experience from the Hill, but what's really important is that she is working on trying to expand our national smart growth movement. Uh, she'll have some updates on that as well. Uh, smart Growth America, you know, has is in partnership with groups like Coalition for Smarter Growth, New Jersey Future, Thousand Friends of Maryland, uh, Thousand Friends of Oregon, and all these other groups, not to mention all the new social equity groups that have popped up as well. We feel, again, like with climate change, we have to move quickly and we have to do uh, in partnership, in coalition from the local level all the way to the national level. Um, Cheryl Court, our own Cheryl Court, many of you know her. She leads our DC and Prince George's work, leads our policy. She is our policy director and keeps thinking up these reports, which are so much work. But thanks to Transit Center, we got the funding for it. And I, but you know, Cheryl does not take a report and put it on the shelf. She enlists the entire staff to then help her implement the recommendations of that report through our various email campaigns and everything else where you all help us do it. So this forum tonight is about implementing change, about implementing better buses. Jordan, hit us with some questions and I uh, want you all to ask big questions. And a lot of it, let's think about uh, what are we going to do together to, to win better buses. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, I definitely want to keep it plenty of time for questions. So we'll probably just do four or five kind of quick uh, questions and try to hit the highlights. We want to talk about the people uh, a lot and also some of the things that we can do here. But, um, you know, as, as uh, Stuart mentioned, I'm from Nebraska. And so coming to D.C. where there's so much transit, Nebraska, you know, not not the highest uh, transit population in the world. So, it you know, it was hard to kind of get my hands around how good or bad of situation we really had here because to me everything was you know it was roses but um cheryl if you could kind of uh talk a little bit about you know what where we've been where we're going how how things are how would you grade uh how we're doing now how would i grade the bus system? how would you grade the bus system <laughs> well in fact we've done that um uh, in fact, I have a copy. Uh, a D, which, from what I've heard. If, uh, uh, if I... um, we, we graded the DC Metro uh, bus, we did Metro bus report card for Metro bus service in DC, not the region. So just, and actually the, just the, the bus priority, the, the major routes, the highest ridership routes. DC gets a D. Um, and, you know, we thought we were, uh, we were trying to do the straight up, we're using um, WMATA's um, metrics about um, uh, on time performance. Um, we're at about 64% on-time performance, which is pretty terrible. If you've ever been standing at a bus stop, freezing cold, or having the rain pelting down on you, waiting for that bus to show up. Um, and uh, speed uh, speed is sort of whatever you sort of decide is going to be your benchmark. Um, so we said 11 miles an hour <clears throat> was um, pretty generous because really it should be faster. Um, and still we were um, falling pretty short of that. Um, a, a little bit better than sort of our reliability statistic. But basically, DC bus service gets a D. And um, and then we spent the rest of, you know, we put together a report to say, well, how do we change that? Dedicated lanes, um, all the uh, things like signal priority, um, faster boarding. And then also, we obviously need to treat our passengers well with giving them great places to walk and letting them, uh, great places to wait and um, connecting to those bus stops. Yeah, and I'm going to get to the bus transformation project a little bit to talk about some of the challenges and, and hurdles of that and some of the recommendations. Um, but uh, uh, Erica, I would like to talk a little bit about kind of the role of smart growth and how this yeah. all works together. Um, you know, part of the idea, I guess, is you know, having people live where transit's accessible and that sort of thing. But what kind of role can smart growth play in, in building transit? Yeah, so I have a mic on. Um, we, so for those who aren't aware, Smart Growth America is a national 501c3 nonprofit. We believe that no matter who you are, or where you live, you should be able to enjoy living in a place that's healthy, prosperous, and resilient. Um, we do that through federal, state, and local actions on issues that deal with transportation, land use, and de development. So not dissimilar to a Coalition for Smarter Growth um, goal and priority um, on the national level, however. Um, so I don't like often don't like to say national, I usually say nationwide because we do work kind of throughout the country. Um, the, gosh, how do I say this? 
so we have a number of different programs within Smart Growth America. One of them is Transportation for America. I saw Stephen grab one of the slides. I was very, very pleased. Um, thank you for using our materials. Uh, the, the, the big challenge I think that Transportation for America has um, as a transportation advocacy arm of Smart Growth America is really you know, not just identifying what some of the challenges are federally, but then how does it trickle down to the state because the state is so much, and DC doesn't have the state, right? But the state is generally so much in power when it comes to paying for transit and really setting the conversation and setting the framework that transit is either successful or not successful in. Um, and when you get to that point of paying for it, you also have to then work with Congress who then steps back and says, oh, well, we don't, we don't get into land use. That's not our thing. We're, we, don't, we don't actually do that. That's the, the local governments. But by the sheer fact that they've set the parameters and set the funding pots, they are in fact in the land use game. So um, one of the things I would say that Smart Growth America has done in the past, and it's not dissimilar, I think, to what a number of our, our local partner organizations do, is really push that conversation through um, any number of you know, data-backed research products that we can then distribute to um, state level groups. We, when I first started at, at the organization, I did start with Transportation for America, so my background is personally transportation heavy, but SGA does expand that beyond that into land use. Um, and I know we've talked with a number of different um, people. I remember a conversation with Veronica, the old director at Tri-State Transportation Campaign, who said, if you guys can just make more data-driven data reports that we can then use, that would be leaps and bounds more helpful than, than really like any kind of conversation that we could have. So we've taken that to heart. Um, and really, over the last year, that specific program, Transportation for America, produced um, a report called Fight for Your Ride which is about halfway down their webpage. It's t, the number four, america.org, um, just to sing from my supper a bit. And um, it has a whole lot of different types of learnings that we have developed as a result of a number of our um, local engagements, whether it's in Nashville or Indianapolis or Wake County. Um, so I think there's a number of different ways that a national organization can be helpful. But I will say, you know, there's, I think there's three items, and I'm, I'm answering this question real long because I want to get it in, like, I want to get it in. Um, but there's three ways, really, that we see not just the field changing, but the way that Smart Growth America itself is developing a response to those changes. Um, one is the idea, and Stephen mentioned this a bit in his presentation, um, this idea that there, there can be a lot of local opposition to, um, to changes in your bus network, to changes in the way that we fund transit. And I think generally there's this assumption that it's all natural and organic. But when we step back and look at some of the opposition that was fomented in the Nashville area for their transit referenda, we saw the exact same kind of race baiting um, tactics used in the Phoenix transit referenda. And I think we'd be fooling ourselves to think that there is not an organized opposition out there. Yeah, I saw the same in Virginia Beach when I was covering transportation. Exactly. Down there. Yeah. So, you know, what you're testing out in Nashville, you're perfecting and taking it to other markets. Um, that's one concern we have. I would say, you know, another concern would really be this idea that education at the end of the day is going to, is going to win the argument. That's just simply not true. Like, for those of us who must educate because we cannot engage in persuasion, then we educate, right? There's definitely a way to do it that could be a little more persuasive, but for those of us who can engage in persuasive messaging to make our point and get people to, to join with us, we should be engaging in persuasion, persuasion conversations. Um, and so, you know, those are just two, I think, examples of ways that an organ a national organization like Smart Growth America can really work with, whether it's individual advocates on the ground, local organizations um, who, you know, whether they exist or not, there's a large number of, of states around the country that don't have the kind of Coalition for Smarter Growth or Greater Greater Washington organizations that have that kind of capacity to kind of help organize people. Um, you know, Nebraska's one of them, sorry, darling. Uh, <laughs> But you know, one thing that Smart Growth America is doing, and actually we're launching it in the next month, is going to be a national advocacy network. We're calling it the Smart Growth America's Wayfinders. And it's gonna be a way for local advocates and organizations to come together to get that kind of like messaging training. Um, and not just, quite frankly, not just on transit, because transit is important. We have really great partners like Transit Center doing some really great work. But for us, in a way, it's more in the, it's almost more on the land use side. We've got a couple of different topics we have to work on, but 
where we see a big gaping hole on the national level is that conversation on land use, that persuasive conversation on land use. So we're gonna be launching a new program called the Wayfinders Program that seeks to help better organize people across the country so that we can avoid this whole cracking and packing by opposition groups um, that helps arm advocates with the kind of tools and um, resources they really need to do something with it, but then also brings them together so they can understand what some of the challenges and trends are. Yeah, and I feel like DC is really interesting in that we have a lot of, like you mentioned, the Greater Gray Washington, the, the Coalition for Smarter Growth, mm -hmm. and there's those type of groups, but I'm wondering, you know, um, Andrew is with uh, the Writers Advisory uh, Committee with WMATA, but uh, Stephen, uh, you know, New York, I know, has a, a pretty good history of kind of gra grassroots uh, transit um, advocacy, but what's what's the best route? I mean, DC doesn't have a, you know, a strap hangers or anything like that. Is that a, is, is that like key or, or what do you need for this? It makes, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. It makes a big difference when you can organize transit riders. I mean, so 10 years ago, I was a transportation advocate in New York trying to get congestion pricing Past. And congrats. It, it, ten, 10 years ago, it failed. And then it and it's passed now. And one of the biggest differences has been the rise of a new organization called the Writers Alliance, you know, that's over the last um, four or five years doing, you know, doing real organizing, getting membership dues. Many of the people they organize become volunteer leaders. Some of them have even been hired into the organization. So it is sort of legitimate community organizing. And I don't think that every city needs a writer's union. I think that often there may be existing groups that can be brought into a coalition, whether that's a uh, neighborhood-based organization, an environmental justice group. But this question of who's there at the table representing transit writing neighborhoods um, is so important. And I think that, um, one of the things that we observed in Nashville, we actually have a postmortem on the, the Nashville transit ballot coming out later this year, is that they created a coalition that looked very broad on paper, but behind the scenes, the whole thing was run by the Chamber of Commerce and some political consultants. And as you know, they, they needed votes in black neighborhoods and they didn't get them. And that's partly because the transit plan was not written in a way that actually benefited those neighborhoods. And it was a huge contrast to a place like Indianapolis, where there was also a voter referendum and the business community was also an enormous champion, but they were really working in partnership with uh, social justice groups, with progressive faith-based leaders who were organizing in the right neighborhoods, who were organizing in neighborhoods where there wasn't as much of a history of voting, and who frankly talked about transit in ways that to me initially were a little bit of, of a surprise. They would go into neighborhoods and talk about the fact that attacks on voting rights and mass incarceration and lack of access to transit were all part of the same system that had kept certain neighborhoods in Indianapolis down. And they were doing that. And at the same time, business leaders were talking about how they needed transit to retain young talent. And it's like different messages, different audiences, strong a strong coalition. <laughs> And that's it's so interesting. There was uh, WMATA's board list today, and you know they're looking at changing some routes and getting rid of some routes. And we did see you know three or four people from uh, Glover Park, one particular neighborhood, that the bus routes would be either combined or go away. So I do see a little bit of that, but not like a you know a, a, a huge unified group standing up for say things like you know uh, bus lanes or signal prioritization i mainly see it more from folks like coalition for Fire growth and and uh, through this bus transformation project um but cheryl can you talk a little bit about kind of what role like the business or kind of nonprofit community has in 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 all of this and in, in advocacy well from an advocacy perspective it's all about um uh, partnerships and really connecting with the right kinds of groups and and civic leaders that are also going to probably um, push back against um, sort of like the negative civic leaders who are like, well, you know, you might take away my parking or um, or you might build a bus stop in Georgetown. <clears throat> you might build a bus something. stop near me. <laughs> Shelter. Um, and and so it's a combination of doing direct 
the grassroots organizing, going out to bus stops, doing petitions, um, and reaching out to say like um, PTO uh, parents who are at, we did, um, we, we ha actually had um, a, a support to, um, to do a very comprehensive effort to create a, um, a, a BRT a bus rapid transit plan for Montgomery County, and and they are starting to build on uh, Route 29 now. And that was um, we had to sort of push back against sort of like um, Route 29 is is a place that's a it has a large um, share of of immigrants and people of color, and then sort of older white homeowners who were basically opposed to these plans. And so the organizing work was around um, looking for those civic leaders, those those new emerging civic leaders who might be you know, in the PTO and, and, and places like that. And in order to um, sort of push against um, a system and sort of the, the, the planning process, which tended to advantage these um, sort of long time older conservative white homeowners. Um, so it was, a, it was a real struggle, but um, we were able to sort of move that forward and, and build those sorts of lines. And in fact, one of the emerging leaders out of this effort was just put on, uh, just uh, appointed to the um, planning board of Montgomery County. So we consider that sort of really an exciting um, uh, progress for Montgomery County. Um, so that's sort of one example, and, and working with um, Casa de Maryland um, and other uh, groups that are, are working directly with um, uh, worker, uh, low-wage workers. Um, and so those have been really important partnerships. I will say on the other end, um, we're really excited to be working with the business community, who we don't always agree with the business community. I don't think that's a secret. Um, but we are thrilled that after working very closely on a huge campaign, over the last couple of years to, to get dedicated funding from Metro. Um, our business partners didn't walk away saying, we're done, we got our, our, our middle class workers are on the trains, we're all set. Um, they, you know, they came back and re-engaged and said, yeah, well, you know, we've got business leaders who we have been on the opposite end of, of fights over freeways who are now just passionate advocates for improving bus service. So this is like, a, this is really a great moment for us to be working on this and, and we're, we're trying, and everything we're doing here is to keep this momentum going where um, we've got these really positive partnerships with the business community. And then we have a, a district government, which has really changed and I, 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 it really resonates reflecting back on sort of like the, the snail space of 16th Street um, bus lanes, for instance. And it's, it's about building the political will and it's changing the, the Department of Transportation culture. And from the first time that I was starting to talk about mm -hmm. 16th Street bus lanes in like the early 2000s um, and going through, you know, petition, iterate, you know, all these different political iterations um, to the second round um, with Kishin and, and a lot of work that was actually done through ANCs, which I'll say is another really important um, for the politics of DC, I will say that um, that's one of our best entrees into building that um, advocacy constituency for bus lanes and, 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 and getting into the question of we need to take away some parking spaces if we're going to really make these buses reliable and fast the way they need to be. Um, so those are sort of some of the, the alliances that we've, we've built. Um, and I think we're at a great moment because I think the momentum is there. Whereas, you know, you know, the H and I was not like something conceived of a year ago. Um, the work group for WMATA and Metro was formed in 2010 for, um, for the H and I, um, bus lanes. Um, and the technical report from WMATA came back in 2013. And then it got all dragged into sort of the case, whether they're going to do it with K street and all this kind of stuff. And it was always WMATA's top priority because it, so many bus riders were moving through, K Street, but it was actually really a difficult organizing challenge because nobody really lives on K Street. That's why we actually focus on 16th Street. Just gotta sneak it in there, the pilot, people. and then it's permanent. Um, but now, but then that, it, you know, it's sort of, I think we're sort of moving towards the momentum where, um, as Stephen, you talked about um, getting these transit planners embedded in the Department of Transportation, even though they're not in the transit agency. Um, DDOT is now doing that. As you pointed out, they're hiring. Yes, they're building up a new program and to create that pipeline. And it can't take 10 years to do the next um, uh, dedicated bus, you know, rush hour, <laughs> you know, partial um, uh, uh, dedicated bus lanes. Um, and so we are optimistic that we're going to take it to the next level and that we're, we'll keep on shrinking that, that timeline. Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. Parent teacher organization. Sorry. It's, it's like the new, it's like the new term. <laughs> the, the new hip parents, you know, I don't know. 
Um, you know, one of the things as a journalist, I've been in, I've covered transportation in three different cities now, and I cover the beginning of something, I cover the middle of something, and, and you know, I leave and it's not done, and I come back and it's still not done or something like that. Uh, you mentioned with 16th, I, I think I saw early 2000s up there. I mean, you know, I was in middle school, um, if you think about it. Thanks. Is there, <laughs> sorry, uh, is there any way to speed this stuff up? Anybody want to answer that? Does anyone have answers? Stephen, that's why you're here. Yeah, I mean, well, okay, so, so, so I, did, I did talk about tactical transit. I mean, that, um, that's a much faster process. And I, and I think that what, so tactical transit has been um, sort of percolating up throughout the transit world maybe, maybe for the last three years. And now what I think you're starting to see is transit agencies start to scale, start, start to try to scale that up to a citywide level. The, the Portland slide that I showed is something that they call the Rose Lane projects, where they did, um, they did a little bit of planning to figure out like where they needed bus lanes the most. And now they're taking this slate of 20 projects to the city council. Um, and I think that another way that we speed things up is I do really think that there is there are ways to do public engagement that are both representative and faster than the way that they're typically done in the transportation field. You know, we can't have these sort of like sporadic open houses here and there where you have an open house sort of once a month and it's dominated by the wow. same 10 people who show up to every public meeting. Oh, I know that. And then those 10 people <laughs> oppose the project and it looks like it's this huge groundswell when it's really a very small percentage of the people <laughs> right. who have anything to do with the project. You know, transportation agencies are increasingly doing things like serving riders on the bus, serving businesses in the corridor. Then you have this sort of like neighborhood wide information that is more representative and you get the large majority of people who don't have time to come to these meetings, but who might benefit a lot. And then, it, you know, it takes some political courage because, you know, those are survey results. They're not the same as the people who are plugged in and are going to yell at the elected officials. Yeah. But it is real data about what the public thinks. Yeah, public engagement in, in this era is so fascinating to me just because, yeah, it does seem to be a lot of the kind of public meetings and whatnot. But yeah. by the way, the bus transformation project had 8,000 people surveyed over two phases. And, uh, you know, it's a great response rate. They really did a great job reaching out. Number one uh, priority was a dedicated bus lanes, bus priority. And for uh, folks earning 50% of the area median income or below, number one, if I got this correct, was a more affordable fares. And, but priority bus lanes is important for them as well. I was gonna say, I do wanna, with the bus transformation project, there's a number of recommendations. Um, and I don't, like you mentioned, there's no silver bullet to making, you know, buses better. But I mean, if we just even wanna just go down the line here, and is there one solution that, you like the most or anything like that. Um, I think signal priority is pretty cool, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know statistics on it, but is there anything specific that you guys are fans of? You know, I, I think it's, I think it's way more, it's, it's more like silver buckshot than a silver bullet, right? It's like bus lanes. You could do little queue jumps in areas where maybe you don't have room for a full lane, transit signal priority, even like where you put the stops, like putting, putting the bus stop on the near side of a traffic light versus the far side makes a real measurable difference. And how many stops you have, like are there bus stops every block or is it something is more reasonable, like every four blocks or every six blocks? You add all those up together and you get pretty big speed benefits. So I, my personal favorite though, I will say is, is all door boarding. I think there's something yes. really magical about just being able to like walk up and get on the bus instead of having to wait in this long line. I will say when the circular was free, yeah, uh, there was one time I tried to get on the second door. Like I was like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "You're not charging me anything. What does it matter what I'm doing? <laughs> Getting on the bus." Um, but no, but just uh, rather than like my favorite, because I feel like you know these two can corner the market on that one. But um, I would say you know for the 16th Street bus line, like I think the answers that you guys are giving are great, but it's those are answers for um, an agency, right? Those are answers that an agency can pick up and run with. I think for everyday Americans, it's still a, a squeaky wheel gets the grease. You kind of have to make it a priority, quite frankly, in your life. 
um, to go and to stop and to spend time and to find out what's happening. And that sometimes takes way too much time. So, you know, having an organization like CSG, having an organization like Smart Growth America, who can actually help you like sift through all of the muck and mire on whether it's the technical information or just the timing of it all, or even just to put in context, you know, I, I grew up going to city council meetings because that's what my mom does, right? Um, but it's just, it's so difficult and the barrier to entry can be so high on some of this stuff, especially if you're like, you know, in a city with a state, um, that it can be really daunting and difficult and, and hard to overcome. But it is at the end of the day, that is that consistently, you know, showing up consistently and having an opinion and not letting your electeds off the hook and not letting your friends off the hook uh, to say like, this is what's gonna benefit our lives. That's important, right? And God bless you if you're, you know, spending weekends with a whole bunch of other urbanists. I love running into them in the, in the airport too, but we obviously have to talk to like our neighbors and our neighbor's neighbors right. about like, what is it and why is it important and what they should do about it. So having that level of organizing capacity, you know, I think is really, really important. Yeah, I, I you know, as a journalist, I'm a staying above and without the opinion and whatnot, but I, I'm I can't- I'm not in the mud with us. I, well, <laughs> well I, I can imagine, you know, this is a, a room of, of obviously passionate people or else you wouldn't be here, but I, I kind of wonder, do you guys ever get discouraged or, or more energized? I don't know if you're like discouragement. Yes, maybe <laughs> the tired. Um, or do you kind of get the, you know, not getting it. So you keep fighting. I mean, that's a, that's a tough place to be in. And, um, uh, Robert Puentes at the, the Eno Center, who's helping to run the bus transformation project, you know, he said uh, he, he doesn't want the plan to sit on the shelf. This is a huge lift. And, and he says, you know, it could be something where, you know, maybe a certain agency doesn't buy in or this type of people that, you know, whatever. But I wonder how, how do you make these grand plans not sit on the shelf, Cheryl? <laughs> Well, it's great you asked that question because on Monday we um, we uh, sent out a press release with the launch of our new Metro Now Coalition um, bus campaign announcement. So that's uh, you know the Metro Now bus campaign is um, largely um, there to uh, support and really figure out how we are going to implement the major recommendations coming out of the bus transformation project. And um, we've Wamada has been through a, a couple of iterations of of major bus initiatives that you know have done some things internally, but this is um, this was an effort to to um, get all the jurisdictions to own it. And uh, whether or not they do today, we um, plan to um, to make make them feel it and um, it be part of. Everybody's going to be part of the solution. Yeah, it's um, yeah. There's so many options, and I know there was some early infighting on. Um, you know, some suggestions would be to move uh, certain routes to the local jurisdictions. The local jurisdictions weren't crazy about that in some places, but it seems like there's so many operators, so many parties involved that uh, to get everyone on the same page uh, seems like a, like a big lift. But there also were really important overarching recommendations. For instance, the fact that we are, are you know, the lead leadership of of the, of the region and WMATA said we need to go to free transfers, which is a huge issue. It's a huge yeah. barrier for um, a majority of bus riders are very low income. And so this is a tremendous barrier. And yeah, to go $2 to, on $2 and, $2 and, $2. and to go to um, a, a low income uh, rider fare product, um, DC is spearheading that. And um, we are so supportive of that. It's, it's absolutely essential. And to getting it at, at um, all door boarding, we need to look at fare payment. And to do that, we need to look at Mobile how, payments. or maybe well, no too, payments. Yeah, In fact, that was sort of an interesting controversy over last year. The mayor um, made the circulator free. Well, so uh, and 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 so that the and the council canceled it. They're like, what? Um, is like you know about two hundred thousand rides a day are taken by uh, on buses in DC on Metro bus and Circulator actually provides sixteen thousand rides a day so it's just a small share of the overall bus ridership in the city so from that perspective it's like well you know um, you know most bus riders are not benefiting from this free fare um, but you know we want to say that the principle is that maybe actually transit should be free um, and let's work towards that so. Um, so going back to a, 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 a discounted fare or free fares for low-income uh, riders seems like uh, 
you know, we're, we're really making, we're, we're starting that process now. Yeah. And nine, I mean, nine month pilot in DC starting next year. Right. So no, 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 we should talk about at today's board meeting. So, and it builds, okay. it builds on, you know, we do, um, our city also does free uh, transit for, um, for children, for school children. Mm -hmm. And so that's also a good thing to be doing, but um, then we can, and then there was a conflict over, um, you know, fare evasion and decriminalization. Yes. That was a big conflict between the council decriminalizing fare evasion with the, with WMATA and the mayor. And so we can we can diffuse a lot of these conflicts by getting to um, making fares more and more affordable to the people who need the, need them most. Yeah, I want to I want to switch to one other kind of newsier item out of Metro today it was the mobile fare payments and one of the things. So they basically are going to take the Smart Trip card and put it in your mobile wallet so you can just tap with your your phone um which is fun but i was like well where's the benefit there and one of the things that they mentioned that i hadn't thought of was bus riders you know they are either you know paying uh feeding cash in to put on their smart trip or you know have to go to a station or or retail to to fill their card uh i think metro said 98 percent of their riders have uh, uh smartphones so now you'll be able to add uh, uh, value to your smart trip on your phone. And so instead of waiting to, you know, uh, feed in the dollar to, you can just, um, you know, pay on the phone and, or add value on the phone and then pay from there. So they're saying, well, that'll speed up bus boarding. So uh, Stephen, I know you're not crazy about certain tech uh, uh, improvements, AV and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, it's kind of those small wins do those add up or what, what's yeah. your take on something small I, like that? I think that there, there, there are all sorts of ways in which new technology is and can make the bus better planned and more convenient for the people who use it. You know, the, the example you mentioned, I think it's really important, whether we're talking about smartphones or for people who don't have smartphones, that that friction of paying um, is really important. It's, I mean, like, I, I have had the experience of like getting on a bus that only takes cash and not having it. And then We're sort of ask myself, well, what am, I, what am I supposed to do? Should I just like try to push on or am I going to get off and like wait 15 minutes for the next bus? It is an enormously like frustrating and alienating experience that can help drive, drive away new riders. Yeah, I, the, I, that was my experience when I first started. I was, you know, just kind of scared, didn't know what to do. There's a, a culture there and if you're not part of it, scary yeah and and when you look like in london for example there are thousands and thousands of stores throughout the city where you can buy or refill a transit pass and it's really obvious where they are and that's just not the case in most yeah. u.s cities and if if you look at fare evasion on buses in the dc region a couple of some researchers from i believe it was virginia tech and nyu did this you find that the highest rates of evasion are in low income census tracts where there is not a store where you can buy a smart trip card. And this stuff, you know, this really, this really matters. And I would say also to, you know, sort of broaden the theme and talk about um, what else can technology do to improve the bus. I think that there are enormous benefits from the real time information systems on the planning side. The same information that tells us as riders, like when is the bus coming? transportation agencies can use that data to figure out where is the bus getting slowed down. And it's a really easy way to figure out where to put bus lanes and bus priority. Yeah. It feels like uh, GPS location and real time data should be like the, the basement at this point, but um, Walmart is just starting to get there, I guess, but um, like to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. If we've got any, uh, it's, Stuart can uh, pass them the mic around and. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, John, John Wetmore with pedestrians.org. Um, pedestrian advocates and transit advocates, are there places where they've worked together successfully? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, transit and the pedestrian environment are really one and the same. You know, most transit riders and definitely most bus riders get there on foot. Um, and it is just that you know you can have a bus service that is fast and frequent but if the experience of when you like get off the bus is that you're walking on the side of the road you're con you constantly have to look around to make sure that you're not going to get uh, struck by a vehicle it, it's not a quality experience so the, the transit experience is the pedestrian experience um i think that groups that work on transit 
should be working quite a bit on the pedestrian environment and and whether or not that's you know a pedestrian specific group or not i think there are i think there are many examples that that i've seen around the country of transit groups and pedestrian uh interest sort of working together um you know just to give one example you know like in san francisco there's a group walk sf and there's also the san francisco transit writers union and they work on a lot of the same projects where the city is trying to improve buses and improve the walking experience in sort of the same place. So they're, they're absolutely linked. Hey, turn on. <coughs> hey there, thanks so much for a great panel. I, I'm Finn, I work as a planner here. I just recently moved to the city and um, I've had some friends who visit and uh, they've said, things along the lines of, oh, you know, I'm visiting, like, I'm not going to get on the bus, right? I feel like in general, a um, you know, bus system much more than, say, a subway system uh, is especially hostile if you are new to that particular city. Uh, so observing that you have ridden the bus in 28 cities around the country and <laughs> the world, uh, I'm wondering, have you observed any um, bus systems that you feel are particularly um, uh, legible to outsiders, to visitors, to foreigners. Um, I feel like that's a major barrier for people who travel. So. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a really good question. I mean, you know, I talk about London a lot because London is the bus system that basically radicalized me in terms of <laughs> <laughs> what can be possible throughout with buses. And London is a really confusing city that's like not on a grid. Or anything, and, and and I and I don't think that the um, it's not that the bus map itself is particularly legible. It's just that the the network is so good. Like you have the experience of going to London now, and you plot out your route, and nearly always it says take the bus, and it, it tells you which routes to take, and then they come quite often. And so I I almost feel, and of course this is coming from the position of someone who like is a frequent traveler and who uses a smartphone, but it's like providing that frequent service and providing that network that provides access to so many places, um, you know, that, that helps a lot sort of beyond the legibility. I, I do think at, at sort of the street level, there's still this question of like shelters and signage and actually, um, Christoph Spieler, who's another Island Press author and is on the Border Transit Center, has written some great stuff about sort of like what you do in terms of wayfinding to make the to make buses really legible. Um, in some places like Paris, for example, it's like all the all the bus stops have names. It, it's not this sort of like very generic post in the ground. They have names and they feel like places, and and that's really helpful too, and, and helps in terms of making the bus feel like it's integrated into the neighborhood. Um, so I think those are my thoughts on that. I would say, so even like a decade ago, um, Las Vegas, especially because Las Vegas is so heavily dependent on tourists, right? And they know exactly where those tourists are gonna be. They've got a couple of routes, a couple of roads that they know like the balance are gonna be here. Um, the RTA there worked with their local school district to integrate volunteer hours into their honor society uh, requirements and part of the way that students in the high schools could fulfill those volunteer hours was essentially by going down and right like this could be a parent's worst nightmare or it could just be whatever going down essentially like to this to like the Las Vegas Strip on some prescribed hours talking right? to a lot of drunk gamblers some great daytime okay. hours uh, and offering to be kind of like that human face and of course they have like vests that say like ask me about how to use the bus <laughs> Um, but they would put human beings in an area and say, like, this is the stop you get on, go three stops and get off, right? They'd make sure that they had, like, the correct kind of fare cards or the correct money before they even got on. So they would take, um, they were trying to handle some of these choke points uh, before it became, like, a delay. I can't, I don't know, I haven't kept up with them, so I'm not sure if they still use that program. It's, like, you know, one or two executive directors later for RTA, RTC, excuse me. Um, and, uh, but I would imagine, like, it seemed like it was fairly successful, so I can't imagine they would have discontinued it unless, you know, there was some kind of uproar that I read about in the papers. Okay, thank you. Um, I have the sneaking suspicion I may be the only just pure transit fan here. I'm not associated with any governmental organization or anything. But 
I did have a question. Um, is there a problem with, since buses are often viewed as sort of the least romantic of the transit options, uh, of competition with like in DC here with the, the, the streetcar on H Street, or they even talking about running gondolas between Georgetown and, and, and Roslyn. Is there a problem with distraction or competition with kind of sexier types of transportation uh, in, in terms of getting adequate funding for buses? Um, I mean, I think that when we talk about sort of the, the stigma of the bus or the sort of image, so much of it has to do with service. I have been really um, struck recently by like looking at people on social media who, for example, like a new bus rapid transit line opened in Indianapolis and they had a tactical transit lane in Los Angeles. So that, that's not even BRT, that's just the regular buses. And people are posting these like really excited, they're, they're so excited to be on the bus and watching themselves like beat the cars in the lanes yeah. next to it. Like that, that ends up being pretty sexy. That's sort of, Street. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and so I, you know, sometimes I think the stigma bus is, is deserved because the service is so bad. And what you find is once service gets better, the stigma goes away. Um, I mean, that said, I mean, there are fun, you know, there are things we can do to make the design of buses a little better. I mean, you know, double decker buses are sexy, but we don't, but, but we don't need, we don't, you know, we don't need sort of sexy transit. We need transit that works. No, putting like the train front on the, uh, the nose on the bus. Okay. You know, it's also sexy electric buses. Um, <laughs> Jessica Leung, um, I work for a think tank called Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. Um, so I do a lot of like nationwide um, research. And so a lot of cities are getting to electric buses. We have the DC circulator. So I was actually really curious about if anybody at the local level is ever interested in electric buses. Um, we know a lot about the public health benefits oh, of yeah. them. Um, you know, they're on the nationwide side, you know, heavy duty vehicles are, you know, 10% of them are on the road, but they're responsible for like 28% of the emissions. And so, you know, they care a lot about the local level, um, you know, fares and lanes, but is anybody really caring about electrification at all? Are you hearing about that and yes. is it happening? Your mic. Um, you know, I'm an odd expert on the numbers and I thought I saw someone from DDOT here. Um, DC Circulator is doing electric buses. Um, they've got, so how many do we have? 14? Yeah, so they just started running them, I mean, within the last like two years, I think. And so they're, um, they're still working on um, bus garage, kind of, there's a larger bus garage issue for, circu for circulator service. But um, yeah, I mean, DC, I think is, has, I think is, a, is like, I don't know enough about other yeah, I know. places, but I think that DC is kind of a little bit on the le yeah. leading edge of that. I know Wilmata is starting a pilot. They've got like one or I, I can't remember, but they're basically starting a pilot to figure out what more can we do. And I, I'm not exactly sure where that's at right now, but um, in terms of the electric buses, the largest thing that, that I've heard in the region recently is in Virginia, uh, where the state is partnering with Dominion Energy to use electric buses, give all the school district electric buses, but then Dominion will be able to use them as batteries in times of when, you know, power's out or something like that and kind of use them. So there's the kind of that interesting partnership uh, out there. But that's school buses, right? School buses, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, it doesn't help yeah, when- cause those are, Yeah, because th those aren't used for, you know, half the day. So. And let's remember, school buses are driving all over the place because they're out in sprawl. Right, so, yeah. Something else not, we have to deal with. Not very with. smart growth there. All right, can, the question here. Uh, hi. Um, so we've talked a lot about buses, and that's great. Uh, another exciting thing in the region is Metro. Uh, WMATA just you know, released a bunch of ideas about how we can expand the silver, or orange, and blue lines, which has costs in the billions. Um, it's easy for people in the region to look at that, a uh, Metro rail expansion, and say, this is what we need to fund. How do we take making buses better, which are so much about individual corridors connecting place A to place B, uh, how do we make that a regional issue that gets regional politicians and, you know, the billions of dollars out? Not that it costs billions of dollars. Well, I think, I think it can be packaged regionally. One of, the, um, one of the interesting themes that I heard from a lot of people inside agencies um, about the sort of um, 
political branding or, or sort of selling of buses is this idea that sometimes bus improvements don't happen because they're so small. They, they seem so small, they seem so local. And so it's really advantageous to sort of package them up into these big programs. Like that's one, one way we can think about a bus network redesign is that it takes something that is sort of the most, one of the most boring of things like tinkering with the schedules of individual lines, but you do it at, the, at a network scale and all of a sudden it's this big project with big benefits. I think similarly, when you look at something like the um, the Portland Rose Lane package that I mentioned, you know, you get this sort of big bang effect by pre by presenting the fact that we're going to make buses better in twenty different places citywide. Um, even the Better Bus Stops program in the Twin Cities that I mentioned, the project manager for that said, you know, it's just so different talking about bus shelters when it's this program that has like its own logo and its own name. It's such a huge difference in terms of how the, like the executive leadership or the board of the agency views it. So there is this, there is something to how you brand these initiatives. Um, you add up a lot of small improvements and it, it becomes pretty big benefits. And that's true, I think, both for the public and in the internal politics. And I would also add, you know, to adding on the idea of like not a silver bullet, but silver buckshot, the um, the idea of growing new leaders, we really need to, and I'm, you know, I'm preaching to the choir in here and I get that. We drastically need to expand the coalition that we work with. And I'm not just talking about like the really great work that the Metro Now campaign is doing. I'm talking about how do we grow leaders so that yes, today we have some great voices like Steven, like a lot of you in the room, we have some great voices who are really putting people's feet to the fire on what spending priorities need to be and should be, but how are we growing our elected officials into the future? Um, you know, I live down uh, in Southwest, Charles Allen my, is my um, councilman, and he, you know, I give him a lot of credit. Like he has been really vocal on a lot of the, the pedestrian safety issues. And I as a pedestrian and a bus rider and transit rider. Um, I really appreciate that. And I'm gonna go to the map for him like as a human being, not as an employee of Smart Growth America. And I wanna make that very clear for our 501c3 nonprofit status. Um, <laughs> but you know, we have to think about how are we growing new leaders and how are we imbuing them with like the tools and the support they need so that tomorrow, today's transit advocate is tomorrow city council member because quite frankly elected officials don't grow out of nowhere often you know there's recent history to the contrary but you know they are often advocates who cared passionately about something look at lucy mcbath from georgia right her son was killed she became a gun active an activist you know to get better gun control she is now a member of congress so moms, moms Demand Action is like, hey, we helped grow this member of Congress, so she's gonna be on our side 100% of the time. So we just have to think about like that, but then also how are we growing active advocates and electeds and, and really tomorrow's leaders, not just in the way that we've always done it, but in communities that either self-organize, I grew up in Michigan, our church is self-organized left and right. Here, not as much, not, or at least not as aggressively as they do at home. Um, you know, the mommy bloggers, for example, you know, here, I don't, the PTOs here are great, but I have a lot of friends in Texas. Those mommy blog organizations self-organize in about 0.5 seconds on an issue. So you absolutely want them on your side. So we just have to think about like, how do we then also grow tomorrow's leaders um, outside of perhaps our traditional comfort zones or our friends' comfort zones? And let me just say that it is so possible, you know, in, Boston transportation advocates there worked really, really closely with the city council member, Ayanna Presley. Now mm -hmm. she's a member of Congress That's and true. she is one of the co-founders of the Future of Transportation Caucus in the House that is rethinking federal policy. I talked about congestion pricing in New York. One of the reasons, one of the other reasons that, that changed besides more advocates was the fact that we had this huge wave in the state Senate and we have a bunch of young progressive state senators who also are actually transit riders too, that don't own cars. That really changed the perspective inside the state house about the importance of transit. Okay, we have to wrap up in just a second. I wanna remind everybody before you leave, buy a book from Island Press and uh, get Stephen to sign it. We'll have the book signing uh, shortly after that. Uh, I don't know what we would do without Island Press. Uh, I've got an entire library at our office from Island Press books because they cover so much in our field and uh, they've been a great ally for all of us. All right, yes, sir. 
of Douglas Stallworth, retired from Metro and DDOT, operating assistance. We worked hard over the region for capital assistance, but you're never going to, okay, you get the buses, but you can't run them because you don't have the funds to do that. And, and that's important too, because you can see that today in the Metro's budget where they have bus, they're proposing cutting bus service and adding service in other areas. And that pits one group against the other. So what are we going to do when it comes to add more Campaign for it. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's so important. And I, I, I think it's really worth, you know, I don't know what your view on this. I think it is worth having this discussion at the federal level too. There was federal transit operating assistance. It went away for the most part. And it's like, what's going to happen when the next recession hits? It was devastating for transit agencies around the country. I, th I think it is, I think we can think big about that. And I, I agree it's important. I mean, I would say, you know, our, in my past life, um, the way that we approached trying to advance um, granting permission in federal law for operating assistance on transit specifically was definitely incremental. It was not a moonshot program, but then I was also a congressional staffer in the thick of it, right? So I didn't have perhaps the luxury to be a bit more moonshot than I wanted to be. Um, but I would say, you know, on the federal side, take the wins where you can get them, however small. Just try to keep moving that boulder uphill. Um, you know, in that failed livability bill in, what, 2008, um, we, I think, in the, if I remember correctly, in the legislative language, you know, we got operating permission for operating assistance because operating assistance is one of those things that has organized opposition, you know, on the back end. They've, they grow, they have their leaders. They've grown their leaders. So you're, you are pushing that boulder uphill, um, but there are like, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time um, until the dam breaks and you have a clear path forward? Like that's, that's at least the strategy we used. I'm not saying it's the most inspiring one, but it's tiny gains is really like what we did, what I did. We all said, all right, if you're not going to ask a question, an elected official gets the last question. <laughs> Conrad? Uh, a, a former elected official. But, but yes, exactly, it takes not years. Uh, but one of the things uh, that was mentioned about giving bus stops a sense of place, the, the, um, I'm a member of the, and treasurer of the Prince George's County Arts and Humanities Council. We went to the state of Maryland and we received, I think it was $150,000 for artwork to be done at bus stops, which does two things. It makes it a lot more interesting to be in a bus stop. And further, it gives a sense of, of being a owner of the community. So um, I just would recommend that we look at the arts as also a way to make the bus stops a more a vitalized um, place to be. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Uh, one, of the, one of the cases that I sort of write about in the book is um, uh, all these, they were tactical lanes in the, in the Boston region, both Boston and a lot of the neighboring municipalities, Everett, Cambridge, Somerville. But... Um, a local foundation was involved in that project, the Bard Foundation, and they did actually um, help provide for some art at some of the stations. And if you look, they're just pictures worth looking up. If you, if you like Google Boston BRT, you will see some images from that program, and it really does make it a nice place to be. And I would just add, let me think for myself one more time, Stuart. Uh, Transportation for America has a whole section on creative placemaking, and um, that we've been doing gosh, as much as we can possibly get funded uh, to try and either place artists in state trans, state DOTs to help them um, use a little more design thinking to maybe not approach a problem the exact same way they've always approached a problem. Um, but then also when it comes to things like creating that sense of place around transit areas or just cultural areas that perhaps the community wants to protect from things like gentrification. Um, we've really been going as fast and hard as we can on something like that. So it's all on T4's website, t4america.org. Um, um, and I would encourage you to like, if you haven't already, take a look and see if there's something that you could apply there. Okay, uh, for wrap up, um, there is a lot of homework if you want to do it. Bus Transformation Project is on the website and the implementation report just came out this week. Allie Davis from Metro is over here. It's, <laughs> she, she, Hi, I'm Allie. gonna embarrass her. She led the way on this massive project. Let's not let her down. <laughs> um, Metro Now has a fact sheet on the Metro Now site. Greater Washington Partnership did a great bus study. You've got the DC bus report card from CSG. 
You've got Stephen's book you're going to go buy and other resources at Transit Center, other resources at T4 America and Smart Growth America. Uh, but the next step, of course, we got all, we know what you need to do. Now we have to get out there and do that. And so as many of you who can volunteer with us, we're going to look at uh, putting together this campaign to make it happen. In the meantime, please thank Jordan Pascal for our great thank you. MCing here. Thanks, Stephen, for joining us. And thank Erica and Cheryl. Thank you all. Get out there and do it.